Hi all you beautiful people. Let's have a look at those SPECT scans of the brain and see how uh, when you change your diet you can actually change your brain. So let's do it. Okay, so let's have a look at this uh, Dr. Boz who is a doctor promoting the ketogenic diet. So let's just see what she says these next uh, three and a half minutes or so. Hi, my name is Dr. Bosworth and today I'm going to do a short clip on the benefits for your brain on ketosis. I'll be honest, when I first went on the ketogenic diet, my mother was suffering with a severe uh, and long-term illness uh, in the form of cancer. And I was really doing the ketogenic diet as a way to support her in her journey. But it didn't take long for me to see that the hype I had heard about ketogenic diets and the improved mental function was very measurable and easy to see what they were talking about. That's what kept me on the ketogenic diet for the last two and a half years and I really thought that I would not be able to concentrate this long ever again. I thought it was a youthful option and when you grew to in your 40s you aren't gonna have that option anymore. I was wrong. The mental benefits of continued cognitive stamina and mental processing, ability to handle stress, has been the reason I've continued on the ketogenic diet. Uh, since then, there's been quite a bit of information that's come out on how does the ketogenic diet help with that brain function and why. The brain enjoys and is able to use sugar or glucose whenever it's available. So by lowering the sugars and increasing the ketones in a ketogenic diet, you'll often hear patients talk about that first couple of weeks, how they go through a depressive phase or they have a uh, they feel very heavy or depressed. But what happens after that is that the brain cells become more adapted to the ketogenic diet and are able to use the fuel of ketone to power their function. As they get better adapted at using that ketone, the mental function grows more and more into one of the best performances that I think the, the brain can do. The chronic diseases that impact your brain, such as Parkinson's, depression, uh, insomnia, sleep apnea, memory problems are all linked to an increased state of inflammation in the brain. This is at a microscopic level and many times patients don't know that they have a, a swollen areas of their brain from that chronic illness. But what they often notice is when they've switched to a ketogenic diet, that second, third, and specifically the fourth week of using ketones as fuel they are all much more aware at how tolerant they are of changes in their life. They don't get nearly as stressed out. Their sleep is deeper. And again, that mental performance is as if you've turned back time and their brain is acting like it was 10 years ago. It's been this benefit that I find continues to attract my colleagues and my patients to sustain the ketogenic diet that it only takes a couple of slip-ups to go off of the ketogenic diet to feel how sluggish my brain can get, um, how irritable I can be when I've, when I've fallen off the wagon onto a non-ketogenic diet. Most importantly, my patients who really do suffer from some major chronic illnesses have all been able to feel the benefits and many of them lower some of the medications used to regulate and help those brain diseases. I hope this was helpful. Uh, click the link below if you'd like more information or if you're interested in a deeper dive into ketosis, you can check out my book any way you can at the link below. Thanks. Okay, so here's another video with Dr. Boz where she shows us these SPECT scans and she talks about epilepsy. Uh, which is also a brain dysfunction and how the ketogenic diet has been used for epilepsy patients for many many years and now we're figuring out that it, can, it actually heals many many malfunctions of the brain so let's just see what she says here but I'm using this story to tell you that the reason I stayed keto was that my brain uh, is, uh, is the reason I stayed keto I, not, I take care of a lot of brains in my clinic. I think of my patients as if you want to take care of chronic illness, I don't care if it's diabetes, obesity, cancer. If their brain's not working, if they're depressed, if they're not sleeping well, 
you're going to struggle to improve them. So the reason I first started studying the ketogenic diet was the seizure patients that were kids who kind of, they, they didn't qualify or they didn't respond well to the medications for children's seizures and they got put on a ketogenic diet. And sure enough, that worked great. And that was, you know, many years ago and they are now dying. And the autopsies for these patients who've had seizures uh, their brains should look awful. Like I'm going to show you some pictures here and I'll say if I didn't know better I'd think that was a seizure patient. Um, because their brains, the circuits are difficult, the conduction is swollen. Um, think of it as lots of wires with water. It's not quite how it is but lots of inflammation with seizures and boy I've learned uh, if you don't want to, you don't want to have a seizure brain as you age. But these autopsies of these kids who had, had childhood seizures, who'd been on a ketogenic diet for life, they had pristine brains. They had, I had brain envy, and I, that's what first got me saying, I need to learn about this. This isn't this. Th there has to be something more to this. That's amazing. That that isn't how we would expect it. So um, when I first got on the ketogenic diet, I. I loved how I felt like my brain was back to being a 20 year old brain where I could focus for hours. I could, I could write a book, which I probably couldn't have done if I wasn't in a ketogenic state, um, meaning I could concentrate so much better. Not only was weight loss part of it, but the brain function has really been um, amazing. So when Thursday came for me and I took in too many carbohydrates and you know, uh, the next day I was definitely irritable. If the first symptom for me that goes haywire when I'm not um, in a ketogenic state uh, is I feel s my, my brain, I get a little headache, I get irritable, my, I'm moody, I snap at my kids more, and it takes two or three days for me to kind of get back out of that funk. Um, of course, a fast does that really well. But um, today in church, I had another person come up to me and say, you know, do you think the ketogenic diet is a good diet for Alzheimer's? And um, I write about that in the book saying, absolutely. We know that a, uh, an Alzheimer's brain is known as the third type 3 diabetes. It's, it's due to high sugars. And I'm going to use some of the slides. I took the little course from Dr. Amen and have been an advocate of his education and his spec scan teaching because I think it does a great job of teaching when our brains don't function very well, what does that look like and can we learn from that? So I thought I'd use these slides to just uh, see if we could, um, I could teach from this. So this is a picture of a spec scan and if you look uh, wherever you see pink, um, pink means eyeballs, so this picture we're looking down on the brain. Um, this picture we're looking, um, the patient's looking towards like this direction. Um, this one we've got the brain up and you're looking at it from the underside and this one is looking at it this way. There's a little bit of pink right there. You can, can't probably see it there. Uh, but these uh, are just pictures of normal and what you'll see is there's not very many holes. There's nice smooth uh, pictures without defects. Um, if you look at this uh, slide, it's an example of what happens to brains as they age. Here's a nice healthy normal brain. Um, but then as you get into your 30s, 40s, and 50s, there's some little divots. Um, and those get bigger as our brains age even further. This is one of the symptoms of chronic swelling on the brain. And we know that everything from Parkinson's to bipolar to depression to um, um, Alzheimer's all have brains that get uh, chronic swelling in them and that swelling doesn't get reset. So um, just to kind of give you some more education, this is a picture of, a, again, a normal healthy brain. And this one had a baseball to the right front part of their brain. I think it was over six months ago. So the brain has still not kind of woke up again. If you went to autopsy for this patient, you'd see a, the brain tissue is still there. It's just not conducting the messages the way it's supposed to. It's kind of offline. And that's from a baseball to the head. So a traumatic brain injury. Um, here's some 60 year old brains. And um, you know, one of the things Dr. Amen talks about when he, you know, goes, you go through his classes, the brain you have today is not the brain you need. And I think, I'm sorry, I'm one of these, it's gonna be backwards, so pretend the words aren't there. I'm sorry, I know there's probably a million better ways to teach the, this and do these slides, but this was easy for me. Um, so these are all 60 year old brains and this one's nice and healthy. Uh, this is a patient who has sleep apnea and refuses to wear their CPAP machine. Just incredible sized holes that are offline and they wonder why the depression is hard and their immune system is just one of the parts of their body that's chronically swollen. And then this is an Alzheimer's patient. 
Uh, I just want you to take a look at that because that's going to be what I um, talk about. Today at church, I had someone ask me if this was the right plan, but I wanted to use these slides to say, guess what else does this to your brain? Um, this is a 37-year-old male who is a chronic drinker. Um, didn't start till heavy drinking, heavy drinking of alcohol till about 10 years ago. But much like alcohol, or much like a brain trauma, uh, when you get a punch to the head, when you get brain trauma, the brain swells, and alcohol also swells the brain. Uh, you get uh, chronic swelling, and it goes offline, and it doesn't uh, turn back on very well. So this guy, 37 years old, really incredibly damaged brain because of the chronic alcohol. Um, you can't uh, fix that until you get good sleep, and uh, I contend you can't get good sleep until you're off the alcohol, so kind of stuck. I think this tells quite an interesting pattern too, I need to back up the camera there a little bit. Uh, this is a diabetic, and when I show this to people, uh, they really have a, kind of a perplexed, uh, um, like how can that be? Look at the holes that are in the brain, this is a 41 year old with diabetes. And they didn't get diabetes till they were in their early 30s. Um, they got a nice big round tummy. They've been overweight, and they think, well, that hasn't caused brain problems. I mean, my sugars are fine. I mean, I think my sugars are like 120. And I'm like, yeah, but if you want a healthy brain, we need to do way better than that. And I think that's the point that when you hear about Alzheimer's being um, a type 3 diabetes, which is this chronic, long-term, high blood sugars for the better part of three decades, um, and then a time where it's not getting that healthy flush of anti-inflammatory because of the um, chronic swelling, uh, it gives you a little bit of understanding to say, how can high blood sugars lead to Alzheimer's? And where is the connection? Why do people with alcohol have a higher rate of Alzheimer's? And what I'm trying to show you with these slides is they all have one problem, which is chronic long-term swelling. Um, let me just give you a couple more just for context. This is a really powerful picture. Let's see if I can pull that in a little. Um, and that is a brain of a 29-year-old woman who had anorexia. And, you know, again, two major problems there, one being that she has uh, malnourishment, but the other being that she has mental health issues. And boy, you put those two in combination and it's a tough, it's a tough life. I mean, that brain is incredibly damaged and she's 29 years old. And so when they would come to me as patients and knowing what you know about the brain diseases, you want them to say, oh my goodness, this is fixable. Uh, the brain you have today is not the one you have to have, but you gotta do some, you gotta, you gotta help me, you gotta help me help you. I, I can't give you a medicine that's gonna reverse all that. This is about a life that gets eight hours of sleep. This is about a blood sugar that's normal. Not, eh, it's pretty good, I got a 120. No, 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 we're talking about brain problems here. So uh, this was the story I was trying to tell the gal at church, and this is a woman named Nancy, and she comes at about 53 uh, years old, excuse me, 63 years old, and she's like the cutest little South Dakota banker's wife ever. Um, she's probably had one or two glasses of wine a month for you know 10 years, so not much of a drinker. Doesn't use alcohol or doesn't use any kind of illicit drugs, but she's got a big, nice round tummy. She's had. Um, She's had you know, high blood pressure, she's got chronic diseases uh, that um, she comes in to see me and she usually comes in once a year for, for med refills, but this one she came in because she got written up at work and she wasn't performing very well at work. And she's had the same job for 30 years. These are her friends, These are her, this is her community and she, um, she's she been missing things at work. It's her, her something was wrong with her brain. So it takes a while, but we do several testing and we've done, do a bunch of other scans, not, not this one. Um, and before long, um, she, I mean, it took us a few visits, but she, I said, this is Alzheimer's. This is early Alzheimer's. And you know, this was several years ago where I said, I, I don't have a good answer for you. I can give you meds that will slow things, but to reverse it, um, I, I know of one place you could go and um, so anyway they, they leave the office in tears they're very upset and the, the husband who is just devastated to say I can't I can't even think to put her in a nursing home or to find a place for her there's got to be something we can do and I said well you're gonna have to like stop your life 
Uh, you're gonna have to like not be in your life for you got to do it now this is a big deal so they actually stopped their life uh, they actually went to the almond clinic uh, so good plugs for them got put on a ketogenic diet really really worked at um, controlling those blood sugars and this was her scan six months later and it's the message I was trying to get to this lady, which was really hard to do at church, but was that the brain you have today is not the one that you need forever. That is, that is undoing Alzheimer's. What? You know, she's like, I think, you know, my dad has Alzheimer's and I, I'm afraid I have the gene for Alzheimer's. And I'm like, then turn off the gene. Stop. Don't be a victim to this. We know the rules that you should start doing in your 40s, 50s, and 60s if your family has Alzheimer's. And that is... We need low blood sugars and we need high ketones. Uh, we need low blood sugars, we need higher ketones. And, um, you know, that um, the first thing that woman had to do was take care of this. I mean, she, she lost her big fat tummy. Um, and that, that was through several things that I teach in my clinic, like, you know, jump rope uh, for one minute a day and, you know, getting your right brain and your left brain and your uh, limbic system all working at the same time for short, short amounts of um, activities. Um, but also eight hours of sleep, you can't have sleep apnea. And then most importantly, uh, if you really want a brain to work right, you got to feed it right. So the first day I go on a ketogenic diet, I have lots of folks reach out to me saying, I feel terrible. I'm like, I know, it's hard. Switching your body to that ketogenic state is something I write about. There's a stepwise, predictable process that I write about in the book. And it truly helps people to understand, this is going to get better. This is going to get better. Um, but the second thing that I encourage patients to do is you should check. You should check to see if you pee ketones. These are super cheap. You buy these little ketone sticks and just prove to yourself that you're peeing ketones especially for those people just going onto the diet and they say, you know, I've tried this before and I, I just couldn't stick to it. Um, instant feedback is really powerful, especially when you're trying to change a chronic habit, like eating carbs. You know, today... So that was our little video uh, with Dr. Boz, where we have a look at how the brain can be so damaged by the way we live, what we eat, and how we can actually reverse these things. So I think it's very fascinating. So take care, my friend. See you.